Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Um, today, we're pleased to provide to you an opportunity for our members, um, the business community and nonprofits in the area to hear from now just two of our legislators. We had a last minute cancellation, um, but in what we expect will be a very informative discussion this morning. I wanna thank uh, each of them for taking the time to be with us today. As we go forward, um, there were a few uh, topics that were submitted in advance that they'll cover, but I think we will have time for any um, for them to share additional information and for you to be able to uh, interact with any um, questions or topics that you feel you'd like to have discussed today. Um, and perhaps even share information about maybe what's happening with your business or organization with the rest of the group. So I'm pleased to announce that again, um, this time as in the spring, our legislative update will be hosted by several members of the Chamber's Government Affairs Council. And that includes Phil Duart and our chair, Mary Ellen DeFrias. So this group of Government Affairs Council's small group convened to advocate for and support legislation and initiatives to improve the business climate and overall quality of life for the region and to educate our membership on issues of importance. So before we introduce our two panelists today, I'd like to invite Mayor Shauna O'Connell to say a few words. Good morning, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And as always, thank you to Chris and your team for um, always doing such a great job in bringing us together, keeping us informed and updated, um, and the board uh, of directors as well. I know that they work really hard to promote the chamber and our local businesses. And it's always really nice to see how much the board and the chamber members support our local businesses by going to events and you know ribbon cut things even if they're on a saturday and that's in addition to everything else you do so we really appreciate that um thank you very much to representative haddad and representative doherty for being with us today to update us on what's going on in the legislature uh I want to just say one thing that we're really um, thankful for from the legislature is the increase in the HDIP, which is the Housing Development Incentive Program, and the LIHT, which is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Um, th there's, there's a lot of development going on in Taunton right now, and there's a lot of opportunity uh, but it's very costly to develop housing right now. And of course, there is a great need for housing right now. In Taunton, we've created our own incentive programs um, because we know how important it is to help spur um, housing and economic development. And our team is kind of always thinking outside of the box and how do we help local businesses? How do we help developers? Our newest program is Revitalize Taunton, which is a, um, it's a really a new concept. It's something that we've never done in the city before, but it's a program that we can give, uh, we're giving grants, small grants to businesses and also low interest loans. So I hope people will check that out and take advantage of that. And that's in addition to, you know, the other things that we're doing, like our really successful sign and facade program that is kind of transforming our neighborhoods and really helping out our local businesses. So we're always open to suggestions too, because you guys are the ones that develop, that run the businesses and uh, you know what you need. But the HDIP and the low income housing uh, tax credit program will really um, add to what we already have here in the city to help us with that um, economic development and housing development and growth. So I am very thankful to our partners in the legislature for advocating for that and um, for that passing through the legislature. It's going to be a huge help to all of the residents of Taunton. Um, so thank you for letting me take a moment and I want to thank Mary Ellen and Phil for um, being on this com this particular committee. It's a very important one and I have to give a shout out to Phil about how great he has been to work with on the city council. Uh, so I know you guys have a lot to talk about. There's probably a lot of great questions and our representatives have a lot of great information to share. Uh, so I hope it's going to be a great session. I am actually at an event at Taunton High School, so I'm probably just going to step out, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing the update afterwards. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We will now thank introduce you. our two distinguished guests. Um, please give a wave as we introduce you. So I'll start with Rep. Carol Doherty. 
uh, the representative of, of the third uh, Bristol district, Taunton and Easton. Her career and community service have focused primarily on education. She was elected president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, serving two consecutive terms. She was later appointed director of professional development in the School of Education at Northeastern University, where she remained for 18 years. She currently serves on the House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change, House Committee on Ways and Means, Joint Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures and State Assets, Joint Committee on Children, Families and Persons with Disabilities, Joint Com Committee on Election Laws, and the Joint Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you. Should I, do you want me to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much um, for that fine introduction. Every time I hear that sort of resume, I think how proud my mother would be. So <laughs> I am delighted to be here as I always am at this event and other chamber events as well. I think that the chamber under the direction of your leadership has become a very strong and vibrant organization on behalf of businesses in the community. And that's so important. Uh, Every time I turn around, there's a ribbon cutting. And uh, uh, Chris is always uh, letting us know that there is a ribbon cutting and we are enthusiastically invited to participate in those kinds of things. And it's all kinds of businesses, as you well know, if you've had an opportunity to attend from uh, the most recently opened, uh, unless I missed one, the um, uh, ABA Center over in the industrial park to work with kiddos who are autistic and who need that kind of therapy uh, in and outside of school uh, as well. And so it's it's businesses like that that are attracted to Taunton and that provide the support and services to, to our community businesses like yours, uh, as you well know. Uh, along with the bid at the Downtown Taunton Foundation, it is an effort to bring people uh, into our community to make them more aware of the advantages that are available through the city of Taunton and to engage people, new people, and the, the community as a whole, people who have been here forever in the conversations that are really important to developing the community as it moves forward uh, and to build the economy as well. So there's a lot going on in the legislature. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a trick to figure out just quite where to begin, despite what the front page of the Boston Globe might say, the lazy, hazy days of the legislature, it's very, very busy. So I'm uh, looking forward to sharing information with you, but I'm also, these are, these are opportunities for me to learn from you. And so hearing from you, time permitting, if I stop talking, there'll be time uh, to hear about what's on your mind, the things that that are interesting and important to you. And if we don't have the answers here, we'll make sure that you have them uh, at a subsequent time. So thank you uh, very much for uh, inviting me here this morning. Thank you, Rep. Doherty. Uh, Representative Patricia Haddad represents the 5th Bristol District, which includes the communities of Dighton, Somerset, Swansea, and Taunton. A member of the House of Representatives since 2001, she currently serves as Assistant Vice Chair of the House Committee on Ways and Means. She has also served on a variety of other committees, including Human Services and Elder Affairs, Healthcare, Medicaid, Natural Resources and Agriculture, Rules and Ethics. Her dad has served two terms as Chairwoman of the Joint Committee on Education, one term as Second Assistant Majority Leader, and five terms as Speaker Pro Tem. Rep Haddad, if you want to give some opening remarks. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you. As I was listening um, to Carol, I realized that I have served with um, a succession of really wonderful people from Taunton. And um, even though it's a small portion, um, I want to thank everyone for being so inclusive of me and allowing me um, to be part of the team that has represented you for, for quite some time. As Carol said, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. Um, so much more of our work is done behind the scenes, in uh, committees, and in small groups than what takes place that is reported in the newspapers. I also wanna say um, a quick thing 
that I always want to emphasize. In our House of Representatives, we have an amazing working relationship with every single one of our members. And I think that's important to point out because we know that there are, there's a little bit of dysfunction in other places. But we have, um, we really have a great group of people. We miss um, our friend Norm Morrow <clears throat> because he is one of those go-to people for me anyway. You know, none of us has all the expertise we need. So we very often have to go to our colleagues and make sure that we're on the right track. And Norm is one of those people that um, uh, he's just, you know, he's been an, en he's an engineer, he's been a farmer, and he is um, uh, so generous with his time and his knowledge. So um, I, again, I, I just want to say that it's been an honor for me and um, I'm, very excited to uh, learn about what you're interested in because uh, we sometimes get insulated with the things that we're working on and the things that we think have to get done uh, right away. And, and we don't realize that there are many things that you're seeing and you're living that we can be helpful with. So um, thank you always for the invitation and um, I'm ready. Thank you, Repadad. So we're going to start with the uh, pre-submitted questions, uh, which I will pose to one of you two to start. So the first um, to Representative Doherty, with Taunton being directly affected by uh, the statewide, my, statewide and national migrant crisis, what conversations are happening at the state level uh, to address these issues? Well, thank you very much for that question. So I, along with my colleagues in the legislature have been particularly immersed in conversations all over uh, government from the governor's office to other executive offices about the migrant crisis. If you've been following the news, you've read in the paper or heard the news uh, about the governor declaring it um, a, a state of emergency and her appeal to the uh, Biden administration for help and support in dealing with this crisis. For Taunton's part, there has been, uh, on April the 7th, all of us, myself, the uh, my colleagues, and the mayor as well, received a call from the governor's office to let us know uh, that morning that that evening there would be uh, a bus arriving at the Clarion Hotel to deliver up 120 migrants. Most of those people who have come have fled from their countries for a variety of reasons, mostly the danger that they have faced uh, and the journey that they have taken to get to the United States. Uh, they have come here, they've come to California, they've come to New York City, they've gone to Texas. Uh, so they uh, deliver themselves to places that they can get to where they might have connections, family and uh, others to get there. We were declared in 1983 in the Dukakis administration, um, a right to shelter state, different than a sanctuary state. A right to shelter says for all people, primarily people in the Commonwealth, deserve a, a right to housing. Uh, and that I, I think that that bill arose uh, as a result of the Dukakis administration way back then, and some of you are too young to remember that far back, uh, when we closed uh, institutions and took people out of institutions and put them on the street in danger of being homeless. And you, I remember those people walking up and down Main Street pushing carriages, uh, supermarket carriages. I don't see them anymore. They've grown old and perhaps died or moved on. Uh, but I think that was why the law was created, and it is still on the books, and then it creates an environment where anyone who is in the Commonwealth who is not housed deserves housing. Well, how do we deal with the now some, including all of the children, some 20,000 migrants that have come into the Commonwealth, we put them in available spaces, hotels, motels, the governor's office has reached out to individuals to say, do you have a room? Do you have a house that you want to uh, rent uh, to house the migrants as well? Here, uh, because we were one of the first shelters, there is, in my opinion, and the, the mayor and I chatted briefly about this, there's less of a 
crisis that exists at the Clarion because the people who are housed there get um, neighbor works that works with them and provides caseworkers for each one of the families. They have managed health overseeing their health and well being, sturdy hospital taking care of the birthing and babies uh, that are that uh, are coming along with the people who are coming into the hotel. Uh, they receive WIC benefits and SNAP benefits and uh, pocket money uh, in order to get them on their feet and when housing is located to allow them to leave the hotel and take up a position in the commu this community or some other community. So the, the, the our, our migrants, if you will, are um, less apt to come under the care, if at all, of the National Guard, which has been deployed to places like, and the Rep Haddad will talk about what's going on in her neighborhood around placing migrants in a hotel there because it's a very different situation. Recently, as early as yesterday, Homeland Security has arrived here uh, to uh, take a look at what that situation is. I reached out to the governor's office to say, if you are involving legislators in the conversation, I want to be involved in that conversation. Well, Homeland Security has created the agenda, so um, maybe we'll get a debriefing as a result of that visit. Um, I'm certainly hoping that, that we will. So they're here to look at the situation because what we need from the federal government is a solution on a federal level we need resources to help us to supplement the resources that we are providing through the state budget to support the migrants. And we need the, the federal government to waive some of the aspects of getting work permits. Because believe it or not, if you visit the hotel and talk with people who are there, they want to work. They want to get out of the hotel. They want housing of some kind. And they want to work in order to support their families in that housing, housing that we would uh, help them to, to find. So it is truly a critical situation for the Commonwealth, if not for the country. Uh, and there have to be solutions that, I don't know what those solutions are, but there have to be, there has to be a better way in which uh, we can help to support people who are fleeing their countries, truly fleeing their countries uh, in ways that are gonna get them on their feet and moving moving forward in productive ways. And lastly, it is, <laughs> when you think about it, you hear, you go into the honeydew down the street from here and there's a sign on the cashier's uh, barrier that says, be patient with our help. We can't find uh, workers to come in. And you see that over and over and over again, even with companies, perhaps even yourself, providing uh, incentives for people to come in and be part of your part of your employ. Uh, and so some of the migrants who could get work permits could perhaps take up some of the positions that we are in such a dire need of filling. So um, it's it's going to be interesting to hear what Homeland Security says and what it is that the federal government is going to how they're going to act. So I'll just pipe in with, it's very different in my district. Um, I have two motels that are housing families. As you can imagine, um, we don't have public transportation. We also don't have social services. So we are dependent upon Fall River. They have their own set of issues. So it has been a little slower <clears throat> than we had hoped that um, our the people who are are in our two venues um, are not being seen as quickly. We have to have the National Guard because there are no uh, the the common areas in these two motels are very small. So in order to give out food, it has to be done in small chunks, small chunks of people. Um, we also have been very dependent on the generosity of volunteers and strangers. Um, thankfully, my my town and Swansea have really stepped up for this crisis. Um, the school department is doing okay because they can run a bus down there. Uh, and it's the same with Swansea. But, but both of, Swansea is on a highway, which is very difficult for people to walk. There is a, 
a grocery store within walking distance. Um, it's a little father in Somerset. And so uh, the, um, the ability to get people to doctor's visits and things like that, we're still working on. Um, thankfully, we ha again, we have people who are being very helpful. Um, but it's the churches and, um, you know, some of the other civic groups that are coming forward uh, to do this. And it's a very small area. So when I go down there and I see the children, um, it's just a little grassy area. And of course, there's no... Um, nothing really for them to play with. So we're now in the process of doing that, trying to get, um, um, I'm waiting for the order of coloring books and crayons that are coming in uh, hopefully today. And so um, it makes me sad because I realize that we're gonna be way behind. And even though these people wanna work, these men, you see them, they're getting a little, um, <laughs> They don't look as happy. They were happy to get here, to be in a safe place. But now I see that they are not happy because they don't want to live in a hotel room. They don't want to be dependent on other people. They want to work. So, um, you know, there's the good and bad. Um, I am hoping that something changes on the federal level because in the greater Fall River area, just like in the greater Taunton area, there are jobs but it's getting people their work permits and getting them to these jobs. So um, uh, we're doing our best. It's just a little more difficult than um, I would like it to be. I, do, I have to say, it's funny. So the, uh, talking with the superintendent, there are about 88 youngsters who are enrolled. They were inoculated by Man at Health. They got their, their shots and they are in school and there are no critical uh, issues to report. As a matter of fact, the teachers who have those youngsters uh, immersed into our newcomers' classrooms, um, report very positive, smiley, <laughs> smiley things, which is a, which is a very good thing. And lastly, the governor. When I said to the governor's office, well, you know, we'd like somebody from Homeland Security to come to Taunton so that they can help us to <laughs> what, what's going on there. And they, <laughs> the response is, well, we don't want to show them good things. <laughs> okay, um, they can go see pets. <laughs> I just found that amusing. So why not show them good things? Because it shows them what they have to do in order to provide mm -hmm. us the resources to have it be that way for everyone uh, who who is here. So thank you for that question. Thank you both. Uh, the next question, we'll start with Rep Haddad. Uh, the South Coast Rail Project is obviously a long time coming to the greater Taunton area. So can you provide us with the status update of that project and when we can expect to be able to take the train from Southeastern Mass. So I'm sure you have seen that there's a slight delay and it will be another six months before we will actually see a train running on a regular basis. What's happening right now is um, a lot of safety checks. They're not going to um, allow trains to be on those tracks unless they are absolutely sure that everything is going to be um, running at optimal conditions. There was a um, an event yesterday that we all of the surrounding towns fire chiefs got together and um, talked about the safety because that's going to be paramount. Some of these tracks that are being reused are very old. I am so old that I actually remember when the train used to come to Fall River. I was a kid, but I do remember. And um, so, so that's part of this process, making sure that all of the work they've done uh, to upgrade and to fix all those tracks um, is on target. And also um, part of the preparation to get this going is uh, what happened yesterday, getting the police, uh, the fire chiefs together, and we need to do the police chiefs as well, because God forbid that there be an incident. Um, we don't have the, uh, the equipment to address it. And there's been one training for um, area firefighters. Uh, the chief from uh, Taunton was there. And that's, um, that's an issue that you know, you have to be prepared. So so they're working very um, hard to make sure that 
they've only, I think somebody said at their department, half of their people had been trained. So we've got a little way to go in making sure there's training, but it is, um, the process is coming along. And although I was a little, you know, when I heard again, another six month delay, um, I have to admit to being very cynical, but when I uh, heard yesterday, um, it, it's a, it's a kind, it's a um, process that we need to engage in, and so I'm I'm being patient again, but it'll be um, unfortunately next calendar year before we see trains running on a regular basis. I think that uh, to exacerbate that, so the anticipation that the train would be on track at the end of the year, I was really excited. I had my ticket in hand and waiting <laughs> to get on the train. But we need to be patient because it's a new endeavor. Uh, however, the critical transportation desert that we're in here, uh, transportation from here to Boston is like, it's a crisis. Yeah. During the pandemic, Bloom shut down its run to Boston and did not resume. Uh, DATCO picked that up and uh, gave notice two weeks ahead of their stopping service in April that they were no longer going to be running into Boston. The legislative delegation, all of us got together with the Department of Transportation to complain and to press them to find a solution. And I think it was uh, Rep. Cabral, uh, perhaps yourself, Rep. Haddad, that put uh, pressure on, um, or oh, didn't put pressure on, reached out to uh, Peter Pan bus because they were running a bus to Boston, uh, to Logan, uh, to please run a regular uh, rider route and they said they would and they would stop at South Station and they have done that. However, and they were picking up people here at the Galleria Mall. The Galleria now has started up its construction for whatever is going, warehousing I think that's going on there. Um, so there's no longer a place for the buses to park, for the cars to park. So they've shifted the stop off, the starting place to Bridgewater. Well, People take the bus to Boston because maybe they don't have cars. They can get from here to the Galleria. Somebody can give them a ride, but going to Bridgewater is a difficulty. So I have been talking with the Department of Transportation um, here in Taunton at the end of 140 and had a call last week to say just that, that they were looking for a place where they, and the state would pay for rental space, uh, where, the, where there would be a hundred parking places in a relatively easy to access location and that they would, Peter Pan would bring the bus back uh, to Taunton as a stopping off point. They were looking at uh, behind the um, Ocean State job lot in on Route 140. Thank you. <laughs> on Route 140 there, uh, a week ago, they were having those conversations, but nothing definitive. And if you, if any of you know, can think of a space that's easily accessible that would accommodate a hundred cars, um, you can just let me know that. And maybe the state can negotiate with the merchant who owns that property. So so I, I think that, you know, we've become a desert of sorts, a maternity desert. <laughs> You know, we don't have babies born here any longer, and we're moving our detox center from the hospital. And Southeast is, uh, and I'm so glad that the mayor points out that there are wonderful things happening here in the Southeast, particularly here in Taunton, but there are issues uh, that we need to address that are going to accommodate all people. And, and just to tell you how complicated it was to make this happen, um, Representative Cabral had a bus that was transporting New Bedford people to Taunton. Fall River had a bus that was taking, you know, the greater Fall River area people to Taunton. Just trying to coordinate all of these things to happen and make sure that people were able to commute. Um, you know, sometimes it's mind boggling, the, um, the resilience of people who want to commute and don't want to use their cars. They're, they're just amazing. So it was great. Um, the the owner of Peter Pan bus was very accommodating. I did promise him that I would say this. When the train comes along, they're going to continue to run a bus. So they want people to know that, that, you know, if it's if it would be easier for you to take a bus, please remember that Peter Pan came through um, when we really needed them. Yes, provided we can find a place for the cars, right? This is true. This is true. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question will start again with uh, Representative Haddad. Over the past uh, year or so, there's been much discussion and anticipation about the tax relief bill, which was recently signed by Governor Healy. Um, can you please describe for us what's in that bill and what um, people can expect from it? So I have pages and pages, but I'm just going to pick out a couple. Um, this, I, I think you know that both sides, uh, well, first of all, there was a bill that came out of um, the previous governor, Charlie Baker, one that came from um, the new governor, Maura Healey. And then each of our sides, the House and the Senate, had a version for last session. Finally, um, it all came together. And it's the biggest tax cut in a very, very, very long time. Um, we we didn't talk about it as a tax cut. We named it an act to improve the Commonwealth's competitiveness, affordability, and equity. And the reason that we said that is because um, we picked, and, and it's hard to pick and choose, but, but we picked things that we felt would have a big impact. So um, the rental deduction, which was at three thousand, um, increased to four thousand um, dollars. It that is going to become a. Uh, it's going to be retroactive to the first of January of this year. Earned income tax credits that we um, we often talk about for people of um, who are more low income. Um, those increased and it's um it's for people under $57,000 so some of you are saying well you know it doesn't help me it helps you because renters are going to be able to live more comfortably and they'll come to this area to to um take jobs we're very proud of the senior circuit breaker um that hadn't been touched in a very long time and um uh, it increases uh the any um, any taxpayer whose real estate tax exceeds ten percent of their total income, that's a lot of people. A lot of people are living on social security and trying to stay in their homes. So we also did child uh, dependent credits for young families. The estate tax. Um, this one is. This one will affect a lot more people. Um, what the issue used to be is if you, when you pass along your estate, hit $1 million, the excess, excess tax that you were going to be taxed went back to the first dollar. We're not doing that anymore. Now, the upper level, if you have um, a $2 million estate, the uh, excess tax will only be on whatever is over the $2 million. And so your, your estate is um, $2,500,000. That means you're only paying that excess tax on the $500. So, um, you know, that's, again, that's going to affect a lot of taxpayers, especially people who sell their homes and they, they bought their homes at a very, you know, very low rate. And now they're worth real money. So um, we did some short-term capital gains. We did um, some business uh, things uh, like the single sales tax factor. So you you know that um, we're now only charging sales tax once. The mayor talked about the housing development incentive and the low-income housing credit. So, you know, again, we're trying to stimulate growth. Um, there's a property tax reduction for volunteer services. We have, speaking of commuters, we're doing, we did a, a commuter deduction. Student loan assistance. This has become, you know, a hot item because if you've got people or people, young people coming out of college, um, we want to help them. So they are, um, it's, it's going to cost about $2 million, but it, it will help people. Um, Lead paint abatement, we don't talk about very often, but it is uh, something that we see in older houses, of course, like the um, Taunton. We also, um, for us out in the nether regions who have uh, communities with, with no sewerage and have to rely on septic, 
we gave a better tax credit to Title V. So, um, you know, it's going to hopefully um, encourage more people to upgrade their uh, septics. We did things for the dairy farmers. Um, we gave an apprentice tax credit. I don't know if there's anybody here who's with the unions. Um, locally produced cider and wine. So we um, we helped out. Those, um, we are now encouraging people to file jointly because there was a tax loop that if you filed separately, um, you got a tax loop that, we're, again, we're trying to make it. This is about being fair and equitable. I guess the most controversial was um, what we did with chapter 62F. That is the... Um, the chapter that addresses when there is an excess of money, how it will be returned. Um, it did not get to the people who needed it the most. So if it ever triggers again, and you know we don't know that that will ever happen, but if it is triggered, it will be sent out on a more equal basis. Um, we did change the stabilization fund cap because of inflation and um, the dollar is worth a different amount now. So we increased that. Um, the current law was, it was capped at 15% of the budgeted revenues. The updated policy is that we will cap it at 25.5%. All of these things go back to the 1st of January in order for people when they um, do their taxes this year, they can get these. Um, let's see, what else do I have? I think that's the, that's the big ones. Um, and again, it was, we looked at it as how do we get our economy moving? And if we don't have um, workers, we don't have workers who can afford to live here and we don't have housing for those workers, everything's gonna come to a grinding halt. So it's not perfect, but I do think that it hits some high notes that um, a lot of people will, will be affected by or with them. Well, that that's pretty comprehensive. <laughs> You've got your notes too. And I are looking at the same, at the same, uh, the same sheets of sheets of paper. It's very comprehensive. And the things at the end of the discussion were not what were the highlights were that were in the discussion among legislators. We were primarily focused on those things that helped low-income families, that supported childcare efforts on the part of those low-income families. Uh, and also uh, seniors, uh, senior circuit tax breaks. And then there are a couple of things in here that are local options that uh, are adopted as part of this tax package, but it really is up to the municipalities. Uh, we do a volunteer program and I look at uh, Phil Duart on the city council knows very well. There's a volunteer program for seniors primarily where their part of their tax taxes can be abated as a result of their work. So for some, we do that here in Taunton anyway, we've done it forever as far as I know, but it now is a local option for everyone. So it becomes uh, something that municipalities are more aware of that they they can do. Uh, and there are things here like the capital gains tax where business folks uh, such as yourself and others are really um, concerned about. Um, there's uh, also, what is that thing about the single sales factor I'm going to look at my colleague, uh, Rep. Haddad, because I've read it and reread it, and it's, maybe it's, someone here understands uh, uh, better than I. It, in this instance, the current law says that there is a three-factor apportionment of uh, a formula where taxes are levied against those businesses. Right. Now it's only one factor rather than three. So I don't know if any of you are it's, subjected well, to that. No, it, it was to get more businesses to come and um, have Massachusetts their home base. So if you're a big business and, and you are doing business here, you're subject to three factors of taxes. So that was one of the things that we wanted to try to make um, our state more competitive and encourage some of these bigger corporations to come here. I guess in the end, it trickles down because of if these big corporations are not paying three different taxes and only paying one, um, it's helpful to whatever they may be distributing or, um, but but that's one of the, you know, people say to me, well, that doesn't help me. 
You know, it, it it does in the very long run if, if again, we're getting some of these bigger businesses to actually locate here in Massachusetts and make this their home base. Does that make sense to everybody? And by the way, had to add physical education. If it's not on a scoreboard, I don't get it. So how did I do? <laughs> Thank that was you. the hardest question. I just want you to know that <laughs> for somebody like me, that was a hard question. Well, it's very complicated. That's it is. It is. Well, we can't all be experts in tax law. <laughs> um, the last submitted question we have for Rep. Doherty, um, can you please discuss the details of the Harmony Montgomery Commission bill that you are sponsoring? Uh, yes, there, there's there's a, a lot to think about, not a lot to say. Uh, you may, all of you may be aware of the horrendous situation with a little girl named Harmony Montgomery, who was given over to her father when she was four years, four or five years old uh, by the court um, and beaten to death. And what the and she was in New Hampshire at the time, but that the state of Massachusetts was complicit in how we manage children who move from home to foster care, back to home to foster care, back to home, like little footballs bouncing back and forth. And as a result of that decision, Harmony was murdered by her father. Her body has yet to be found. Uh, the other case of fall in Fall River three years ago was the David Amon case, basically the same situation where the David Amon uh, was given to his family who were well known to be unable to care for him and they starved him to death. So every time some horrendous thing happens in the Commonwealth, we become concerned about what, what's going wrong with our system that's creating these situations and environments for our children in good faith, perhaps. But at the end, it is lethal for our children. And these are the cases that we hear about, cases where children die. We don't hear on a daily basis what happens to children who are placed inappropriately uh, in back home or wherever. And it is the right of a parent to want to have their child, but we need to do a better job of being sure that that is a safe place for a child. So I joined Senator Moore uh, in uh, on a bill, filed it on the House side called the Harmony Montgomery. Pat, I think you're co-filed on this with me. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yes. Um, I always reach out to Pat. <laughs> we're a team. We're a team. And uh, it is, it very simply asks the legislature to agree to create a commission and one might yawn and say, oh yes, another commission. My intention is to be like a dog on a bone with this commission if the law is adopted to make sure, and it will be made up of stakeholders, agencies who work with children who are uh, in these situations uh, under the care of the Department of Children and Families and to uh, make sure that our rules and regulations, uh, laws, way on the side of these children and their families where that is appropriate so that these children are safe. And that's really what we want to do is to see where the weak spots are, applaud the strengths, and make the changes that are essential to protect our children. There are about 7,000 children in the care of the Department of Children and Families. Uh, social workers do the very best that they can. Uh, everyone who is working with children do the very best they can, but we need to be more vigilant and more careful about how children are placed. Uh, it is their lives that are at stake. So that's that's what uh, that's about. Um, there are a couple more things that are going on at the state level that you probably have heard of, and it's like, whoops, so were we dealing with that? We were handed a gun reform legislation sometime at the end of July. Um, or middle of July, I think. Uh, and uh, the infamous, and you drive around town and see those signs, call your representative, HD 4420, Second Amendment rights are in jeopardy. That was pulled off the table uh, because there were too many complaints internally uh, mm -hmm. about how that was presented to us. The speaker had wanted it to be adopted by the end of July. They've reframed the bill 
and have put it back on the table they, uh, Thursday. So the bill was unveiled on Thursday. The speaker announced that he wanted this to be disposed with by the end of this month, which is two weeks away, and called for a hearing on the bill uh, by the Ways and Means Committee, of which I'm a member, for Tuesday. So the bill is unveiled to the to us and to the public on Thursday is a long weekend and a hearing on Tuesday. About 160 people came to testify. Uh, and as you can imagine, those people who were in support of gun reform in any form and people who are adamantly opposed to gun reform. Uh, so you uh, watch the front page of the paper because you will um, watch the uh, read about or listen to the uh, work of the legislature in in this regard. It's um it's a bear. Mm -hmm. Some of you may be interested in talking privately about what you're thinking about the bill uh, about gun reform generally. Uh, I'd be happy to. We'd all be happy to uh, to hear from you. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll just I want to add hop back to um, Harmony Montgomery because what your uh, my partner and your rep didn't tell you is how hard she worked to find the right mix of people to be part of this commission. It's not the usual suspects. It is um, people who are deep in the weeds of uh, trying to be helpful. You know, she mentioned social workers, but there are many others who. Um, who will be um, asked to, to you know, give some insight into how we can better improve our system. On the gun bill, as you can imagine, it's very difficult for somebody like me who has um, a lot of sportsmen, a lot of, um, uh, you know, I don't, I have only your small part of a city. So uh, for me, it is, much more difficult to find my way to yes. I am so, um, you know, I, I'm so sensitive to what our colleagues in the urban areas are dealing with. Fall River, New Bedford down here, we're now having uh, real shootings and real murders. And yet I have family members who um, immediately start calling me and point out to me that that's not what we're proposing is not going to really help. So um, it's not going to be an easy place for me to be. Um, again, I, I want to get to where my urban colleagues need me to go. But, um, uh, you know, I, I have to look at things very differently. So I'd love to hear what some of you think, because um, I'm very truly having a hard time with this bill. Yeah, I, I I agree with that, uh, Pat. I I think that for people who are not gone, I'm a I'm a school teacher. I'm an educator. Uh, I uh, care about um, poor people. I want more housing. These are the issues that I that I focus on. I've learned more about guns. Something that I didn't want to didn't learn. Didn't care about. to know. In the past two weeks, than I have. Uh, than I have ever known. Uh, stocks and barrels and repeaters and AR-15s and or AS's 15s or whatever, whatever they're called. And so it's a difficult bill to crawl through. I have a constituent who is opposed to the bill, but he, we talk back and forth all the time and he did testify on Tuesday, but he took the bill and he analyzed it, 122 pages on the weekend and sent it to me. And he said, I did this just for you. <laughs> and it's a it there are, he, he talks about things that are positive in the bill he talks about things that are purely administrative and are only modest changes and he talks about things that are draconian and that he he himself opposes and why he opposed it but it's the best analysis that i have yet to see i'd love to share it with my colleagues please do please yeah. do <laughs> because it's it's insightful um about that so anyway so let us hear from you. All right, thank you. I will turn it back to Mary Ellen. All right, uh, Chris, I know we are running very close to the end of time, but did any questions come in while we were having this discussion? Not seeing any questions come into the chat at this point. Um, we are about five minutes from wrapping up. 
Um, if anyone has something, we have a few minutes um, to address any follow-up questions or anything else that our legislators can share with you. Oh, Laura, Laura Douglas. I was gonna bring you up. <laughs> if there were no uh, questions, morning. I had something. Go ahead. Yes, good morning, everyone. It's uh, so so great to have this chat and to hear about the various issues um, that are so important to all of us on this call. I want to, first of all, th uh, start by thanking you for your advocacy of public education, especially Mass Reconnect. It's just been a great example uh, of, of the work that you're doing um, in Massachusetts. We enrolled 612 Mass Reconnect students this fall in a very short amount amount of time, uh, just surpassing our greatest uh, expect expectations. Um, so it really has been wonderful to welcome these students back. Um, but my question has to do with the supplemental budget. The state budget was approved in August, um, yet the supplemental budget has yet to be voted on. And actually, uh, it has been a little problematic for, for us and uh, some of our faculty and professional staff at Bristol Community College, um, because in the up budget um, is their uh, as approval for mm -hmm. their collective bargaining approval uh, based raises and um, we it's been a very long time since they've had a raise of course inflation has been very high uh, we know the legislature always approves this and so we're not worried about the approval it's just that it's taking a little bit of time and as you know as former teachers both of you salaries can be quite low our faculty at, at uh, Bristol Community college started about $60,000 a year. Um, so they're really hurting right now and, and looking for this supplemental budget to be approved so that they can get their retroactive uh, raises. Uh, and I just wanted to ask, when do you think the House will um, uh, hold a formal session on the supplemental budget? And is there anything that I can do to help uh, push this along? I, I ask that question of Ways and Means twice a week. <laughs> up with the supplemental budget because we get scores of emails from people that you are describing and the same people sometimes will write and I'll say I used to write long messages and now I write not yet <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. let you know uh and that is the answer that I get from houseways and means anyway not yet it's not yet scheduled and Pat being closer to the center of that universe may have some insight in terms of what's holding it up but uh there's a couple of more uh, bargaining agreements that are very close and they want to do them all. One of the issues is um, they want to be all done at the same time. Um, the second is that there are a couple of things within that budget that there's still their policy changes that um, are still being negotiated. But yes, you're right. It's it's coming. It is very frustrating. But in some ways, um, it's we're trying to make it easier for um, the administration, because you know if, if we're redoing um, collective bargaining and dribs and drabs, it's hard for them. They want to like do it once, put it into their computers, and and get it done. Um, what I wanted to um, point out to people was that uh, BCC were was uh, you were hosts to a. Uh, California delegation who are work who's working on wind. They were quite impressed with your facility. So um, we there was the National Wind Conference was last week. So we had people from not only all over the country but all over the world. And um, the delegation from California was looking for help, and so we sent them right down to you. Thank you, Rep. Haddad, and I understand you did a great job on the panel as well. So, uh, yeah, we're very proud of our National Offshore Wind Institute, and uh, we understand uh, this is kind of hot off the press that we're getting a Mass Inc. Innovation Award for our, our work in the offshore wind um, training and education space. So, uh, please, at any time, let us know what we can do to help, because this is not just a Massachusetts matter. Uh, we, we really need to help everyone get to this place in order to effectively change uh, some of our climate issues. So thank you so much. And if you don't know what's going on down in New Bedford, please take the opportunity to go, especially if you're a thrill seeker. Um, <laughs> they actually have a tank where they're teaching people what 
it would be like to crash in a helicopter. I know you're not that much of a thrill seeker, but it's really, really interesting. So if you have an opportunity, um, go down and take a look. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Thank you. thank you both. And thank you, President Douglas, for that question. I'm going to turn it over to Chris to just do a couple of last minute reminders and get you out of here on time. Thank you, Mary Ellen, so much for hosting. Thank you so much, Phil, as well. Mayor O'Connell, Representative Doherty and Haddad, all I can think of with your last statement, um, Rep Doherty, is wow, you must be having a really rough week if you'd like to have a uh, helicopter crash simulation <laughs> fill your day. <laughs> um, so thank you all and all of the attendees on the call today. We really appreciate it. I really want to thank the representatives for their transparency and their honesty. Um, we uh, This is a really unique opportunity for the folks on the call to, to hear directly from them. And I really appreciate how uh, candid they are with us. A uh, couple of programming reminders. Next Tuesday morning, we will thank our hosts, TMLP, for hosting a coffee and conversation, a networking event uh, on their at their Weir Street location. And then the following week, um, uh, SCU Credit Union is hosting an after hours at the facility in the industrial park. So lots going on here at the chamber and obviously um, throughout the state. Thank you all again for being on the call and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.